Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for those of you that have just joined us. Uh, I'd like to extend a welcome virtually to George Mason University and the School of Business and the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship. Uh, my name is Eric Murray Bojek. I'm the director of the center, and I'd like to, to welcome you tonight to our webinar on visualizing real estate data for effective decisions. Uh, but first, just to introduce uh, the center for those of you that don't know us. So the center is George Mason's platform for real estate education. Uh, we have uh, academic programs such as a master's in real estate development. Uh, we're excited to launch an undergraduate uh, real estate uh, development minor in, in the fall of 2021. Uh, we uh, put on pro educational programs like this year round. So thank you for joining us. And we also support research at the university for topics related to real estate development and the built environment. And for us to be able to do what we do, we'd like to thank the members of our advisory board. These are some of the leading firms and organizations in the real estate industry that support our, uh, that provide financial support as well as strategic uh, guidance for our program that enable us to deliver programming like the one we're delivering for you this evening. So tonight, we're going to learn about visualizing real estate data for effective decisions, understanding and presenting actionable information from raw real estate data are now critical skills needed by competitive firms. Companies are capturing more and more data from buildings, users, projects, and markets. How can real estate professionals better identify opportunities and recognize threats from this growing flow of data. Tonight, we will learn the basic principles and best practices of, on how to effectively visualize data and design charts and presentations to support, to support effective real estate decision-making. Our featured speaker this evening is Len Kiefer, Deputy Chief Economist of Freddie Mac. He is an economist who helps people understand what's going on in the economy housing and mortgage markets. He joined Freddie Mac in 2009 and has served as the Deputy Chief Economist since 2012. Len is responsible for primary and secondary mortgage market analysis and research, macroeconomic analysis and forecasting. Uh, prior to joining Freddie Mac, uh, Len was an assistant professor at Texas Tech uh, University in uh, Lubbock, Texas, and has also taught here at George Mason University. So I'd like to turn over the uh, presentation to uh, Len. Excellent, thanks, Eric. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, hi students and guests. Uh, um, really excited to be able to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is data visualization, um, which I use all the time. It's, it's an incredible uh, skill that's really, I think, helped me to connect with folks and, and advance my career and also to really, you know, uh, make informed decisions and, and enhance sort of our, our, the way that, you know, we even think about the world. So I want to share with you some of the insights uh, that I've picked up over the years about data visualization and how you know, you can effectively use data visualization as a way um, to, you know, tell the story, to communicate, and also to drive the uh, decisions. That's absolutely my experience. You know, just a little bit about me and my role at Freddie Mac, so you have some context there. Uh, I work in what we call our economic and housing research group. So I'm the deputy chief economist. I report up to Sam Cater, who's the chief economist at Freddie Mac. And we serve a sort of two functions at, at, at Freddie Mac. Um, you know, we help uh, externally communicate to the broad public, uh, you know, trade groups, real estate professionals, loan officers about what we see is going on uh, in the housing and mortgage market, uh, the economy more generally, but specifically really what's going on in, in the housing and mortgage market, you know, with home sales, home prices, interest rates, uh, and how that's going to affect, you know, future business. So we do a lot of uh, research and analysis around those topics. And then we also serve a role internally within our company. Uh, Freddie Mac, you know, is a large company that funds about one in five home loans and is the single largest or close there, sometimes Fannie's up a little bit higher, but you know, one of the top suppliers of credit for multifamily. So we've got a lot of risk under management. And so there's a lot of very smart people who are thinking about that. And, and my, my team enroll 
uh, helps to support sort of analysis and decision making around you know those aspects of you know uh, credit risk mortgage uh, market. So um, and in that role, data visualization in both roles is absolutely essential. So uh, I'm going to share with you you know during this talk a little bit about sort of just kind of how I think about data visualization to give you some guidelines and some basic principles, uh, and then really dive in uh, to some uh, case studies to give you examples of charts that I've used uh, in the real business world uh, uh, to, to help folks understand what's going on to, to communicate to them and, and talk not so much just about the, the economics and housing stuff behind it, though I'll, I'll mention a little of that just to give you context, but really to think about the decisions that went in to the, the construction of the chart uh, so you can kind of see at least how you know, those guidelines I may or may not have applied to guidelines, not necessarily rules. So, you know, you might break them uh, from time to time as well. But I'll try to talk about that. And then uh, I'm really looking forward to, as we get uh, to the end there, if you want to ask, you know, questions and, and, and talk about that, I, I, I really enjoy that. And, you know, what your perspectives or your experiences are or, or other things that we can share. So obviously, I think data visualization course um, need to have some uh, data visualization to look at. So I'm going to load up some slides here. Uh, so we can uh, uh, take a view of uh, sort of what uh, we're talking about. So just uh, give me one moment. All right. <clears throat> I want to start uh, with uh, what I think is uh, not a good data visualization. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, as you know, we're putting together a lot of charts. I do a lot of experimental charts. And I'll talk a little bit about the difference between a, an exploratory chart versus an explanatory chart or a chart that you might use to help understand the data versus a chart that you might use to help uh, communicate uh, the data. Now, this, this chart here does neither of those. Uh, this is a failure, a graph failure, which I often, you know, run into. That's okay. You know, I'm big on experimentation. Uh, but uh, the point here, I modified this Wittgenstein quote about, you know, what can be charted at all can be charted clearly, and where you can't chart, uh, you should then be silent. So I think as a guiding principle, sort of when I'm putting together a data visualization, uh, clarity is not the only goal. You also want to inspire people. You want to move people to action. Uh, you want to be able to get people to think a little differently maybe yourself, maybe others, uh, you want to create some visual interest. Those are also important aspects of data visualization, but clarity and sort of driving home your message, uh, which this chart is an example of not doing that because it's you know just nonsense. Um, although I was attempting to do something uh, when, I, when I had uh, created that. Uh, so thinking about that as a guiding principle. Um, so the guidelines are kind of three parts. I'm going to talk about the guidelines. Um, there's you know a lot of great material out there uh, I'll, I'll provide some some links, some resources that I found particularly useful that, that sort of give you a full course on data visualization. Uh, I'm not going to try to cover all of the you know new science that's out there about data visualization. It's a growing field. It's very exciting. You know, there's a lot of folks uh, currently who are thinking critically about data visualization, about visual perception, about how people ingest data, and what are the most efficient ways and effective ways to do that. A lot of really exciting research that's gone into becoming these, uh, you know, the basis for these guidelines that I'll share with you. Uh, there are a lot of uh, resources that you can find available online, some of them for free. I'll, I'll point out one book that I, that I particularly like um, that can give you a lot more detail. But to just kind of ground our discussion, I will give us, you know, some, some guidelines that I find useful as a way for framing sort of thinking about it. The real meat of this talk is the middle part where I'm going to try to go through a case study of uh, using data visualizations to help you know, with a business problem. In my case, I'm an economist. They asked me to talk about the economy, the housing market. You know, Obviously, in 2020, we had the COVID-19 pandemic and how that has affected the economy and housing markets. Um, that's a big story, but that's what I'm asked to talk about. And I use a lot of data visualizations to help me tell that story. So as part of the talk, I'll tell a little bit of that story or at least pieces of it. But really, I'm going to focus in on how the data visualization tools uh, can be very, very helpful in telling this story and also help inform our thinking. I have an example of some charts uh, later on in the talk where it's actually, there's some, I think, some real intellectual content in there, to, at least in terms of how my framework for thinking about you know, this large macroeconomic shock and the economy and housing market's response uh, to that. And then finally, um, I, I want to talk a little bit at the end about the, the important distinction between exploratory visualizations uh, visualizations that you make perhaps for yourself or for you know a small group of interested experts 
uh, that are, allow you to really go into the details or really see things in a new way. I, I think that's a very, very important aspect of data visualization, but you can't conflate that with data visualizations which are geared towards helping to communicate. Sometimes they can be the same, but often they aren't. And so uh, data visualizations that are great for uh, exploration are not necessarily the best for communication, although the principles still apply, but you know, it's sort of where you're gonna bend or you know, bend some of those guidelines uh, really depends on, on, on what you are, you know, what's your purpose here. So let's talk a little bit um, about data visualization guidelines. Um, about a decade ago, when I started at Freddie Mac, or a little bit over a decade ago, I was fresh out of uh, graduate school. I'd finished up my PhD. I'd spent a little bit of time at Texas Tech University teaching there. Um, it had come up, and my background, you know, uh, was not heavily into data visualization. I really didn't know much about it. It's somewhat embarrassing uh, to look back at some of the charts in my dissertation or early work. You know, they, they violated all these guidelines that were, were really, you know, um, hadn't thought critically about data visualization. And, and at Freddie Mac, I, I had an opportunity to attend a, uh, a seminar given by uh, Edward Tufte, who's one of the sort of uh, giants of data visualization, one of the major sort of figures. He's written very influential books. Uh, he would give these seminars for a couple of days where he would go into great detail of his book, lots of examples. And it really opened my eyes because I had not thought critically about data visualization. And it wasn't, it was an emerging field about a decade ago. You know, there were definitely people working on it, but it wasn't, hasn't exploded since then. So now, there's a tremendous interest. There's just a lot of demand. Data, as Eric mentioned, is just sort of all over the place. And, and analysts, folks that are you know, coming into careers in real estate are, are having to deal with lots of data and powerful data visualization tools are, are really in demand. I know, you know at Freddie, there's just a lot of folks that are engaged in this, you know, active in a community. They share ideas, they share sort of strategies and tactics for how to visualize certain types of data. Um, and they use these, these guidelines or related ones to help them sort of frame effective visualizations and critically important. And senior management, uh, you know, who I'd say a decade ago was not, they, they weren't, they were a little more indifferent about it, but have become start to crave that because they can see sort of how powerful these data visualization techniques can drive decision making. So uh, uh, there's just this, you know, these are very, I think, important. Um, and so having a framework for thinking about it, if you've never thought about it before, uh, is very important. So if you're new, you know, you're, you're just sort of starting out and you hadn't really thought about data visualization, you might try to find some of these foundational texts. I'll give you an example of one uh, that sort of walk through some of the basics of visual perception. How do people actually react to visually to data uh, to lose that science to help inform them uh, and to come up with uh, principles or, way, or guidelines for how you can effectively structure and create data visualization. So a brand new book that's come out this year uh, that speaks to this is John Schraubisch's book, Better, Better Data Visualizations. Uh, John's a, a researcher at the Urban Institute, um, has written some, numerous books on presentations and things, um, um, uh, really thoughtful about sort of the tactics of visualization. So he's, he's got this brand new book out uh, and it's got a, an introduction where he talks about five guidelines. I think they're a very useful framework for thinking about uh, data visualization. So I want to share those with you, talk a little bit about them and how they apply uh, to data visualization. And then we'll use that as we move through the, the case studies later on in, in the talk. Uh, this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list, but I think it's a useful uh, set of guidelines. Um, the first one, it sounds so uh, you know straightforward that you wouldn't think, well, of course, uh, you should show the data, but actually, it's actually quite easy to get lost and lose sight of that. Um, you know, as you sort of think about sort of constructing, making a chart, if you're making your first chart, uh, you know, you've got tools at your disposal these days that are just in, incredibly powerful. You know, all different types of software. I happen to be a fan of R software, but I also use Tableau, I use Excel. You know, you can do a lot with a lot of different uh, programs, but those programs have, 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 in response to the tremendous demand for data visualization, have made, you know, more and more chart types, you know, available to the analyst. And it's easy when you're starting out uh, within, you know, you know, you've got a tool, you've got a powerful tool, uh, it can make all kinds of interactive charts or animated charts, uh, to lose sight that the real star of the show is the data. 
And what you want to do is get out of the way uh, from the sort of fo folks you're communicating with. Don't get in between. Uh, and by having embellishments or you know different uh, elements of the data, and it's easy to do. It's easy to lose sight of. And, and, and showing the data particularly really requires some thought and to think of what is the actual relevant data. Because uh, if you have like massively large data, it's not really feasible or useful to plot you know, millions of data points on a chart. You certainly can do it um, you know, with a scatter plot, for example, but, but it's not necessarily very informative. So as part of showing the data is really being thoughtful about what is the right level of aggregation, what is the right transformation? What is the right sort of you know, data analysis tool that's going to help uh, when you present it graphically? So this isn't a course about data analysis, but data analysis, data science uh, is integral part of data visualization. There's sort of two sides of this modern you know, uh, scientific uh, you know, advances in, in, in big data. Uh, so, thinking thoughtfully about what is the data, how can I present the data uh, effectively, what, is my, what does my audience need to know about the data? And here's where the analysis is important. You've got to do the analysis beforehand if you're communicating, if you're not just pure exploring. Uh, and so some places I see people get frustrated with in a business setting is places where you show too much data. You know, you give a busy executive uh, all the data, that's not what they're asking for. They're usually asking the analysis, uh, the analyst, to do some analysis and come to you know, some conclusion from that. So you've got to show the data in a compelling way, but to know what that is, you have to do your work on figuring out what kind of subset, what kind of focus, what aspect of the data, do you need all of the history? Do you only need part of the history? Uh, there's a real art to that and it's really context specific, but I'll try to give you some examples for how, how with some strategies to show the data. Uh, related to showing the data is this idea of reducing the clutter. Yeah, as I mentioned, you can add you know, all kinds of embellishments uh, to, to graphs. It's easy to do with modern software. Um, all kinds of colors, layers, uh, multiple views, dimensions. Uh, often that can get in the way. And so as a thinking, you know, discerning about what should I present, you got to often less is more. So stripping away unneeded visual elements uh, is, I think, something that uh, a sort of first time a novice data visualization, you know, uh, a person, the person that's working on data viz uh, as a beginner. Uh, I think one of the things that can be very powerful is to just kind of strip away the things that are not essential. Again, that's that's going to depend on what you know considerations of one are, um, and you can take it kind of too far. I mentioned Edward Tufte, who's again a, a venerable figure, um, and, and he has this notion of the data ink ratio, which is uh, how much data you show per dot of ink on a piece of paper. And in, in an extreme case, you could just maximize for data ink ratio. And so minimize grid lines, axes, uh, annotations to just show the data. Um, and in extreme, that may not be the ideal answer. You could potentially take it too far in, in depending on, on the context. Uh, and in fact, context is incredibly important you know, when you're presenting this information and data, the, really the answer, question you're answering and, and where your audience is coming from is going to determine sort of what's most relevant. And so using text annotations together with graphics can be an incredibly powerful tool. Almost, the, I'd say, the number one most powerful tool for making data viz, you know, knocking up a notch is annotations. And those can include like headlines, right? If you think of the title of a chart, one of the biggest missed opportunities that folks run into when they do a data visualization is to not uh, put an effective title on the chart. You know, rather than just be descriptive, you actually can sell, tell your audience, sort of drive them towards a conclusion. What is this actual chart uh, saying? Uh, but also adding other annotations um, can give the audience uh, a better sense of what sort of this means. And, and it's very, very powerful. Uh, a related, uh, a technique to try to help reduce the clutter is to think about small multiples. I'll give you some examples of a small multiple, but a small multiple is a way to deal with overplotting. Because again, often you'll have a lot of data, maybe a lot of cuts, a lot of different dimensions. Uh, and if you try to plot it all at once, you try to do too much. Even with annotations, it can be difficult to digest. 
So the use of small multiples is an incredibly uh, another very powerful tool uh, that a data visualization, you know, a beginner or even an expert uh, can use. And I, I've got some examples of that and a way in which that can help convey a lot of information compactly. Uh, and then fifth, and I think uh, uh, equally important as a guideline is this notion of starting with gray. You don't have to necessarily end with gray, but you might want to start with gray. And, and what I mean by that, or what, and what John means by that, um, is that, you know, color is a really powerful visual cue. You know, the advertisers know it, you know, television, marketing know it, know it, you know, use color, people are really attracted to it. And, and so it's easy to go overboard with the color. Uh, if you go too extreme on the minimalist, but you might use maybe too little color. So color creates interest, but you might want to be deliberate about the way in which you introduce colors. And so a way to do that, a practice that you can engage very easily to sort of uh, build up sort of, you know, being very deliberate about the color you're using is to start with, you know, a grayscale graphic and then only add color uh, as it enhances the ability, your ability to really tell your story. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind with colors is some folks are colorblind, so you want to increase accessibility. So there are tools that can help you, you know, make colorblind friendly graphics um, that are uh, uh, available. So you might want to think about that, like a red to green color scale is very common. Uh, you see that a lot in finance, um, or red, yellow, green, stoplight. Um, that it works for a lot of folks, but folks that are colorblind, that might not be the most best solution. So either you can use a colorblind friendly scale, or you could also dual encode, where you don't solely rely on that ability to discern between you know uh, those colors, uh, can be another uh, tool for that. Um, there's a lot to be written about all of those aspects. Uh, there could be more guidelines that you could use, but I think it's a pretty useful set as a starting point for what what how could you think about um, you know. If you're going to do, you're going through your checklist. What would be sort of a way to sort of set up, you know, get you started? I think this is a useful set. You can check out John's book. You can look at some numerous other books to find other guidelines. But for this talk, uh, I'm going to use those to help frame our discussion. That was kind of very abstract. Um, and so what I want to do is try to bring it to be more concrete by thinking about how we can use data visualization. In a, in a business setting. So I'm, I'm using case, real world case, you know, talks that I've done. I, I'm asked to come and speak to all different types of folks in the housing mortgage market. You know, often they're at banks or they're real estate professionals, credit risk managers, default, you know, or servicing people, all different types of folks in the, in the mortgage space uh, to talk about what's going on in the economy. We put together forecasts and analysis around that. And the big challenge over the last uh, year has been uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has really challenged our ability to sort of just, you know, process things. And I'll give you an example using an animated chart that I, that I shared uh, with folks uh, last year. So what this is showing you is uh, the pattern in jobless claims in the United States as a percent of uh, the labor force. So, and it's going back to the 1960s. And we've gotten to the end here, uh, close to the end here. And you can just see the way in which the COVID-19 pandemic just completely uh, was off of the charts, quite literally, in the sense that, you know, if we're going through the 60s into the 70s into the 80s, we can see the sort of blips up and down in uh, jobless claims. And then as we get to March of 2020, there's just this uh, gigantic explosion. And that happened not just in the jobless claim charts, but in a lot of charts. A lot of charts I put together, you know, if I didn't adjust the default axes, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, completely uh, uh, blew them up, right? And it, be, it became a challenge to how to present that information and how to think about it, just because the scale of the number of claims that we've been seeing, uh, even today, this I think was updated, I think, late last year, but uh, even today, it's still extraordinarily high compared to history. So I want to give you some examples of some charts I've used to help talk about that unprecedented nature and to give folks the context to help them see sort of what you know, I see in terms of emerging in the economy and then particularly as we go to the housing market. Um, so as an economist, you know, the one thing that's inescapable is to talk about sort of the macro economies, to think about sort of how can you summarize the entire U.S. economy in a single number, it's impossible really, but as a, as a placeholder or starting point, U.S. real GDP is often a useful summary statistic uh, to at least give you a context for where we are. 
Uh, and so in this chart, I'm showing annual growth rates um, from 1930 up through 2020, uh, up to the advanced estimates that were posted. Um, I think they may have been updated recently. Um, but, and I'm, I'm showing you as a bar. And bar charts aren't as exciting as some of the uh, data visualizations that we see, but they are uh, a very powerful uh, tool. Um, and I've used some color. Um, I'm using color here red to signify periods of decline, which is not usual. You usually see expansion. Um, and I also use some annotation. This notion, you know, the, the guideline there to try to add uh, annotations is very helpful in terms of adding some direct labeling. So I've labeled the years in which the declines were, were pretty large. So in this case, you see 2020 uh, was at three and a half percent. And, and some context for that, because if you're not an economist that tracks G GDP, uh, that can be difficult to have a sense of sort of what that means. So adding some context helps. So one thing folks might remember is, well, what does it look like compared to back in 2009 when we had the uh, Great Reset, well, you know, Great Recession, which uh, up until last year seemed like uh, to me like it would be the largest decline I'd see in my lifetime. It had been up to that point. Um, but it's see that it actually uh, dwarfs it. So you can see that red bar for the end point goes down. And you say, well, when have we ever seen anything like that? You have to go back to 1946. Uh, then of course there was a defense drawdown. So you really gotta go back to the 1930s uh, to, to ever see a contraction in the US uh, real economy uh, that was as large as what we saw uh, in 2020. So integrating some annotations here, it helps give some context, have some labeling, I've used a fairly minimal style, though I do have some grid lines on here um, to help sort of focus on really that 2020 versus, you know, those previous periods. Um, in a similar uh, vein, I have a similar structured chart just to think about, well, what was actually driving that decline? Uh, well, it was actually all in services on the personal consumption expenditures on services. So we ask, what was the contribution to that three and a half percent decline? Nearly all of it was in services. So in this case, you can see the unprecedented nature of the COVID-19 pandemic normally, except for the Great Recession, consumer spending on services actually has been rise, been positive all the way back to the 1930s. And then you see that the actual absolute decline in services, you know, we never, at least since the 1930s, have had a period where the US broader economy was, uh, uh, you know, shut down in the, in the way that we did last year to, to battle the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So these were two sort of very similar charts of a bar chart, which can be um, pretty powerful. You know, it's, uh, you're not introducing sort of a, a, some more, you know, abstract charting types, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to some of those, but just a straight up bar chart um, can help provide some context. Uh, you can see very clearly that 2020 was an extreme outlier. And then you can think about, well, how might that have impacted things or how could we uh, understand sort of what that might do to the economy? So that's one strategy is to use labeling. Here's another strategy I like to use to help um, deal with sort of these very, very large movements, right? A lot of this early part here talking about how can I just talk about the COVID-19 pandemic because it's just so far off the scales. So another strategy I like to use is to provide some additional context um, by zooming. So in this, in this case here, I've got two plots that are showing the same data. This is US non-farm payroll growth. So it's showing how many jobs on net uh, did the U.S. economy add? And it goes way, way back to the 19, late 1940s. Um, it's hard to see, and that's intentional in the sense that I just want to stress how large the shock back in uh, the spring of 2020 was, right? And I've color-coded periods of expansion in blue and a contraction in red. So I'm using some color, but not, you know, not a, not a lot, but a little bit of color there to help help tell the story there. And at the bottom, I've employed what I like to use is called a rug plot, which are those strips on the bottom panel. So if you just were to focus at the timeline, if you just were to focus on the timeline and you just look at this period, this candy striping of blue and red, uh, you can get a sense of periods when the economy was adding jobs or losing jobs. And it lines up very closely with the recessions and contractions. 
And then if you want to zoom in, if you use this type of a, a, a composite plot, allow you to zoom in to a, a, a little window. So in this case, I'm looking at 2019 and 2020. So it's breaking out, uh, it's zooming out and giving you additional context so you can see, and you've got this gigantic bar of nearly 20 million jobs lost uh, back in the, the, the March, April timeline of 2020, which is an enormous shock to the economy. And then you saw the economy was adding jobs back and then that growth slowed down, slowed down, slowed down. And the last data point is actually nearly invisible on this scale. Uh, so a direct label there, a little blue 49, tells you that there was 49,000 jobs in the estimate for January. So it's positive, but just barely. And so it provides another way to give some uh, context. You give some long history and then zooming in helps you sort of see both compare the, the full history, which can be useful, um, versus the uh, more recent uh, period. Let me just give you one more example of the labor market chart. Just to give you context, again, which I'm struggling, the, the challenge I'm trying to solve is I'm trying to communicate to folks, this has a, been a major shock. If you just look at changes or percent changes, it's, it's easy to get misled because the numbers are just so astronomical. So what is a way to, to analyze the data or to transform the data in a way that can then help folks get some context for where we are or where we have been? And so the, the, this last chart on the labor market here gives us a sense by looking at cumulative job gains or losses during expansions and recessions and then the most recent period. Uh, so this is looking at as each month, the BLS tracks how many payroll jobs were added to the US economy. And you can add those up, accumulate those over the entire either recession or in red or expansion in blue to give you a sense of how many jobs were added. Uh, and so that the chart line gives you sort of the flatness or the steepness of the slope tells you about how fast we're adding jobs. And then I added some annotations on here to help you see, for example, in the expansion ending in June of 1990, US economy had added 21 million jobs. In the subsequent recession, economy lost about 1.3 million jobs. Uh, then there was a long expansion up until the dot-com uh, bubble there in uh, 2001. And over that period, we added 24 million jobs. Again, you can see a modest uh, decline and then an uh, expansion up to about 7 million jobs. The Great Recession hit and we lost then a very, very large amount of jobs of 7.3 million through June of 2009. And at the time that was, you know, that was very tough. It was certainly a tough economy. Um, but then we had a solid job growth for nearly a decade or a decade, I think precisely. Uh, and then the COVID pandemic hit and we can see that giant spike down, that 20 million uh, in essentially a couple of months. Uh, but then to give some additional context, you can compare where we were, where we are as of January, um, and see that we're still down about 10 million jobs, worse than the Great Recession. That's even with half a year of recovery. So just another way to add some context, add some labels, to do some data transformations to help you see sort of uh, what, uh, how things stack up in this uh, pa pandemic economy versus prior periods, and it's hard because it's just not uh, comparable in a lot of ways. Now, with that context for the economy, I find that those data visualizations have given me sort of a way to sort of help ground uh, my audience, the folks I'm talking to about the thing they really care about, which is the housing market. Like, what? How does the yes real estate market respond? Uh, and so, given those sharp declines. You know, it would be natural to have expected that, well, the U.S. housing market would have declined very sharply, and indeed it did for a couple of months. But since then, the rebound has been uh, incredibly strong and, and in some sense un, un, unexpectedly strong um, uh, or surprisingly strong in some way. So I want to visually talk about, well, how can I communicate what, uh, how the housing market responded to this massive macroeconomic shock? which we reviewed you know, in some of the, the, the prior slides. So I wanna think about, I wanna study a particular data series. So I find it useful to consider alternative visualizations of the same data series. Um, so you can consider different transformations and how they give you different views of sort of what's, uh, what's been going on and different ways to think about them. And we're gonna build up the complexity a little bit to get to more and more complex visuals that I think have a payoff in the sense of help us you know, visually interpret what was going on in the housing, U.S. housing market over the last year. 
So for the example I'm going to start with is for mortgage purchase applications. So the Mortgage Bankers Association every week releases an index on home purchase mortgage applications. It's a measure of how many mortgage applications for home purchase uh, are being uh, you know, submitted in the United States. Um, and it's reported as an index. I find it useful to think about indexes as in changes. So what about the percent change? This is showing a percent change over a 52 week period or one year for this applications index. And if you focus on the left part of the chart prior to 2020, you sort of see these bars running around, you know, they bounce around, they're noisy. There's a week a little bit in the latter parts of 2018. And then we get into 2019 and those bars, you know, they blip around some noise in the estimates. But in general, we were running somewhere from five to 10% uh, 52 week growth rate you know, for most of 2019. Then you get to 2020, uh, the pandemic hits, the housing market activity contracts. So you can see that here with the bars, you see a decline of nearly uh, over 30%, 35% or so in certain weeks there in the spring. Um, but then, then a pretty sharp recovery, a very sharp recovery, and that where growth, instead of growing 10% year over year, by the summer was actually growing at 20% year over year. And so, uh, if we look at that and I see, wow, that's a really strong growth. Well, how, how can we stack that up? How can we think about that? Well, let's try to consider potentially an alternative data visualization of these same data that help you think about what's, um, what's going on. And in particular in the housing market, seasonal patterns are very important. And so I'm gonna give you an example of a small multiple to help uh, show the seasonal pattern in the housing market. So instead of showing the uh, percent change, I'm taking the same index values and I'm showing the index value week by week of the year. So in each of these little mini plots, you have weeks of the year from zero to 52 or 53, depending on you know where the cal calendar falls, how many weeks were there in the year and what has been the pattern of that plot, uh, of that series in that year. So in 2001, this red line depicts the you know, non-seasonally adjusted mortgage applications in that year. And you can observe a pattern, you know, there are these sharp blips, those are correlated with holidays, you know, the 4th of July, uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, New, e New Year's Eve, right, where you see contraction in activity. Um, but in general, there's a seasonal pattern and it's pretty consistent. You can go across and compare different years and to help give you a comparison in gray, uh, behind the chart, I'm plotting all the years. So the gray, this kind of spaghetti that's the, uh, behind this red line is giving you the context for the range of year of all the years from 2001 up through 2020. So you can see the 2005 was sort of the peak of the housing boom when housing, you know, we were at the top of this pattern and you go back to 2010 or 2011 when the housing market was very weak. Um, but in all of those years, you still see a very similar hump shaped pattern. You know, it has a different amplitude, but you see, and typically, you got seasonal um, uh, patterns, holidays, uh, but the key is the spring housing market activity heats up, you get to summer and then fall and things taper off. And that's the sort of normal, typical pattern till you get to 2020. And then in 2020, when normally the housing market is ramping up and housing market activity is expanding, the strongest uh, was when the, the shutdowns hit the U.S. economy and when the real estate activity uh, really, really contracted sharply. That corresponds to those 30% declines that we saw in the bar chart before. And what the bar chart didn't make as obvious is just the sort of seasonal nature and how it hit during a period when we would normally expect to see the housing market really expanding. Let's take another step in the analysis of these same data, consider another visualization to incorporate some model uh, view, some data analysis view of what we might've expected to happen prior to the pandemic versus what actually happened. Um, and this was a chart that I used, updated regularly last year to help me explain sort of how the housing market had responded. Okay, so now I'm, I'm not showing, I'm showing it on a, not a small multiple, but a time series and I've truncated it to just focus on the last few years from 2017 up through, uh, I believe this was late, early December, 2020 at the time when I put this chart together. Um, again, you see the same seasonal pattern with the you know holidays in there and you have this sort of soft upward trend in it in the trajectory representing, you know, those 10% roughly uh, increase in the bars. 
And now I've added some annotation and some color to help tell my story through data visualization. So the dotted line, the blue dotted line, are what we call an ARIMA forecast. So ARIMA is autograded, autoregressive integrated moving average. It's a time series model to take into account the trend in the underlying data. So if you look at the trend, we've been, if you look at it, you see there's these, this seasonal pattern, but there's also an upward trend. So if we were to just project that trend forward, what would we have expected to see in quote unquote a normal year? So what was the trend line we were on up until the pandemic hit? That's the blue dotted line. And then the pink solid line is the pattern, is the period of actual applications that we saw. So during that uh, pan pandemic effect, we were very low, well below what we had expected. And then in, since about the middle part of the year, activity had really heated up. And now I've applied some shading. So I've created this lake. This blue lake is a period where the blue dotted line is above the pink solid line. That is a period where we are running well below trend. So you see that really sheep, sheep, street, steep, excuse me, uh, drop off. Uh, in that period of time, we were running, you know, we were expect the model was expecting in a normal year, we would be having a lot of activity in, in, Mar in the April, May timeline, but we didn't get that. Um, but then in the later part of the year, the housing market really was catching up. In fact, it was, we were having an unseasonally strong activity as folks that maybe had delayed a home purchase were unable to, you know, uh, view a home or buy a home, get an appraisal. Um, uh, at the time uh, the pandemic was most severely impacting the economy, we're able to catch up there into the later parts of the year. So you can compare that pink area to that blue area to get some sense of, okay, well, we had stronger than expected a a uh, activity, but perhaps that activity um, is just catching up. And so people had planned to buy a home and they just had shifted it instead of in spring when they normally do, had to buy in the fall. And indeed, uh, just one more, um, Oh, and this is the same thing, just using that, that, that small multiple framework so you can see an individual year. Um, so you can see the same, this is the same data, just now I'm, I'm plotting it by week of year rather than the overall uh, uh, X axis. Um, but if we, if we ask the question, well, what's bigger, the, the pink plateau or the blue lake? Uh, it's hard to see visually because it's hard to compare areas. One of the challenges of data visualization is that area charts can be hard visually for folks to, to compare. So rather than ask folks to say, is the blue lake bigger than the pink uh, plateau, uh, is to actually calculate it for them. And so I've created another visualization, again, exploring the same data, just another iteration to say, well, what was the expected path? That's the uh, blue dotted line on a pre-pandemic. What was the actual path, the blue solid line? And then what was the 2019 path as a comparison? to give you some sense about, well, what happened in the market? If you look at, focus on the two blue lines, the dollar line and the solid line, you see the cumulative applications over that period fell well short of what we had expected and even fell below 2019 for quite a while. But then by mid part of the year, by week 25 or so, we were crossing. Blue was in cumulative number of applications was a passing, surpassing what we saw in 2019. And only in the last part of the year, the end of the year, did actual applications catch up to their pre-pandemic trend. Now, I wouldn't necessarily show all of these visualizations in the same talk, I, although I have in, in, in some of them, but these are, are different visualizations, give me different options to talk about different aspects of the same sort of time series, the mortgage applications in this case, uh, to give different, enhance, you know, focus on different aspects of uh, what uh, has been going on in the housing market. But I also use a lot of other you know, data that I talk about. Um, so I'll give you some examples here. And if you want to explore them in the Q&A, we, we can go through them. Uh, I can bring them back up. I'm happy to uh, share these slides if folks want to uh, look at them. Uh, I've posted most of these charts uh, elsewhere before, but I'll, I'll, I'll send them all along. Um, one way to help show context is again to use color. So in this chart, I'm looking at housing completions. So how many housing units got added in the United States, either total, single family, which are one unit properties, multifamily um, structures, uh, how many units were added, and added some color here to help give some context by comparing, you know, blue are periods where you had at least as many in 2020, 
where I'm using yellow here to indicate periods where it fell below. And so you can see that despite the increase in construction activity, uh, there are only a handful of years, about five years prior to 2008, when the US economy added fewer, had fewer housing completions than in uh, 2020. So if you're out there in the market thinking about looking to buy a place or rent, you, you might notice that the inventory is incredibly tight. In fact, I have a data next chart here to show that the number of single family homes for sale uh, is incredibly low. Uh, it's probably due to that, the, those, that low level of housing construction. I want to talk a little bit more just about context here, and then I'll wrap up with uh, with consideration of uh, commu uh, exploratory versus explanatory, and then uh, happy to take questions. Um, so house prices uh, are something that we focus a lot at and, and Freddie Mac, and thinking about sort of what has happened in the latter parts of 2020 has been really remarkable. Uh, so I want to share with you just a way to think about sort of zooming in again, but a powerful technique I've used for geographic data. Um, so here is a look at the national house price index, house price growth in the United States, um, measured as a three-month growth rate, because I really want to focus on what was happening at the end of 2020. So this is a three-month growth rate, but then annualized. So if you go to the last data point, uh, annualized growth rate for the United States was over, you know, 17%, which meant that over the three months ending December, house prices were growing at a rate such that if they kept that rate for 12 full months, the house prices would have gone up nationally over 17%, which is incredibly uh, rapid pace of house price appreciation, uh, well exceeding anything we saw over the last uh, you know, three years and even rivaling what we saw during the housing boom. So that, that gives you some context for the United States, but I really just wanna set this up as a framework to you know, look at this chart, okay, and, and, and hold it in your mind, because I'm gonna advance to say, well, the national housing market is a useful thing to talk about, but really real estate is very local. So how can we show what's happening locally and compare across locations? Uh, well, the following plot, this geofaceted plot, I found is a really powerful tool uh, for doing that. So what I'm showing you now here is the same idea, the same concept or the three month annualized growth rate. But now instead of doing it for the United States, I'm doing it for each state and DC uh, in the United States uh, over the same time period. And I'm using the small multiple, but not just a, a small multiple allied uh, you know, in a rectangle, but actually using you know, people's familiarity with geography of the United States, use a geofaceted plot. Uh, you may have seen many of these in the newspaper, folks. Uh, this has become very popular, and they're, I think, a very powerful tool. If folks are familiar roughly with the geography, uh, you can get and see spatial patterns. Um, and besides, just like a choropleth plot, which is just a you know, shaded map, you can actually see the time series for individual states. You can compare the trend uh, and you can look up and see up there in the top left, Idaho, uh, those red bars, nearly 40% growth rate annualized at the end of the year. Um, just extremely uh, strong house price growth. Virginia, DC, strong growth, but, but not nearly uh, as strong as there. Um, so th th these type of uh, geofacets, I think are a great way to show state data uh, and, and uh, folks you know, can, can get a trend and you can compact a lot of information in a very, very small space. Um, just a couple of comments on exploratory versus explanatory. Um, most of the graphics I've shown you, um, while I, I don't think I 100% adhere to all of John Stravich's five guidelines, I, you know, we're, we're, we're adhered to most of them uh, and they had been of explanatory in nature. But a lot of times, as a data analyst, part of your job is to, you know, look at and understand trends. And so to do that, exploratory data visualization can be a really powerful tool and something that you want to have in your arsenal. You got to be selective about when you roll out sort of more complex charts because uh, they may frustrate uh, or, you know, uh, folks may not have the time to, to learn how to read them. Even some of the charts I showed you, some of those cycle charts might be a little too complex depending on the nature of of who you're communicating with. But when you're doing exploration, I think you have a lot more freedom and it can unlock some creativity and it can reveal and uh, give you some sense about uh, things, patterns in the data that you may not have expected. So I just wanna give you a couple examples of exploratory versus explanatory graphs that I use. I'm gonna start with just an explanatory one. Something that my team at Freddie Mac works on is a mortgage rate survey. So it just shows you what is the uh, average rate across the United States for pop different mortgage products, in this case, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, what's the average rate? So uh, as of 
a week ago, the average was 2.81% in our survey. And just looking at a standard time series, you can get a sense of the trend. I put a, a dotted line on there to give you a reference. You can see the rates up at least until last week were very low. Um, they've moved up a bit uh, this past week. Um, that's more of a very, uh, you know, pretty standard. I'm not using elaborate colors. I have a little bit of blue, but it, this is a pretty straightforward time series chart. But I want to contrast that. These are the same data for other sort of more exploratory charts that I like to use um, to think about what's been going on. So I'll give you an example, uh, just a couple examples here to page through. Uh, you could imagine using density plots, for example, compare where are the decade averages of mortgage rates. I'm, I'm, I extended the time series to go back to 1971. The top panel is showing what are the decade averages. Uh, then I've shaded between the decade averages. And on the bottom panel, I'm showing a density plot, which gives you a sense of the frequency of where the values are and the peaks and valleys of, of the diff little mountains there. Uh, it can give you a sense. And as you can see in the 2011 to 2020, rates had averaged about 4%. But at the end of that year, they were incredibly low. A little bit more complicated, but you know, I think creates some visual interest. On a similar line, uh, you could even get more abstract. Uh, you know, sort of like the um, uh, you know an album cover here, the pulsar plot here showing the the stylized densities. Um, but it can give you some sense about how to compare uh, distributions and values over a year. Or you could even have a little bit of fun with it uh, when on the holidays, uh, make you know a little bit of an animation. Um, didn't talk a lot about animation. I showed you a couple. Of, or at least one other animation, I think it can be a powerful tool, but you got to use it uh, sparingly. Um, you can also play around with shadows. Uh, there's a lot of more information available. I just want to uh, offer a recommendation for two books. I talked about Stravich's book, but also Klaus Wilkie, who's a professor at the University of Texas, has, a, has an excellent book. The online There's an online version that you can read for free. You can get a physical copy for a modest, very modest fee. Uh, it's an excellent book. Klaus says um, he's an R, he does a lot with R, but this book is not R specific, R programming language. He talks about the fundamentals of data visualization, walks through a lot of examples. He's very thoughtful about different you know, ways to, to do data visualization. Um, it's an excellent uh, resource. And if you happen to be an R programmer, he's actually put out um, uh, his slides on, a, on an R specific course for data viz. But this book, in an example, this one is not programming specific. It's really talking about the fundamentals of data visualization. Um, an excellent resource. I, I, I really enjoy that one. And I also mentioned John Shravish's book, uh, Better Data Visualizations. It's a newer book. It's got a fantastic array of data visualizations, all different types of examples, uh, and some, some, some thought about that one. So you might want to uh, check that one out. And then just finally, um, I do a lot of data visualization that I share. Uh, I got a little uh, a blog. Uh, that you can get, download our code for a lot of the charts, most of the charts here. I've posted that before. I'm also active on Twitter and LinkedIn if you just want to get daily updates for charts similar to the ones that I've shared with you uh, today. And so uh, at that point, um, I hope uh, that was helpful, but I'm uh, happy to pause here as we're getting close to the end of the hour and see if folks have any questions or things that you wanted to discuss, other aspects of this that I could you know, explore with you or other things you're interested in and knowing about. As for, for those of you that have questions, please feel free to plug them into the Q&A box and uh, we'll get to them and, and have Len, or if you want to see other types of charts as well. So one question uh, from the audience, I think going back to the chart that had the um, uh, growth of jobs and loss of jobs. Uh, yes. One question there was, why aren't the blue and red lines connected uh, isn't the data cumulative or cumulated? Yeah, they are cumulative, but I uh, there's a there's a dis there's a jump uh, because you have the end of the expansion is February and then the next data point is March, and so the lines themselves aren't aren't connected there. So it's it's for example here in February it might be a little small, but in February of 2020 uh, that's the end of the last expansion, and then you go to March it becomes a new new category. So there that's the, there's a discontinuous jump. So this is that. That changed there. Okay. Second question um, uh, from the audience. I really dislike pie charts, uh, which which I kind of agree they're kind of overused uh, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, but why do people use them so much? And are there better options for displaying data other than pie charts? Yeah, you know, pie <laughs> pie charts are have gotten a terrible rap. I think Edward Tufte said the only thing worse than a pie chart is several of them. Um, <laughs> that, that may have gone uh, too far, I think. 
Because I do think in certain kind, if you have a small number of categories, um, it can be an effective way, especially because people are familiar with them. They have an intuition. Everybody likes, or most everybody likes pizza. So you've got a sense of, you know, what the pie share is. So I think that's why they're popular, but they're definitely out of vogue in the data visualization community these days. Um, a lot of folks avoid them. Um, they consider, you know, bar charts can be an alternative if you're sharing things or, or a, um, you could also try a dot plot or a molly pop chart. Um, there are a lot of different alternatives. It really depends on, on the context though. I'd say if you only have two or three categories, uh, they can be effective because the one thing they take advantage of is folks' familiarity. So that does that is why I think they're so popular is that po folks can relate. It's not it's it, it has people like circles. I think uh, there's been some research that people find circles attractive. So that 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 has some nice uh, things. But yeah, from a visual perceptive perception point of view, they're not the most efficient. And often, in many many cases, other alternatives are better. In in most cases, like a bar chart which isn't as sexy or as exciting, but that often happens to be the best answer in many cases. What program software uh, were used to create some of these uh, more advanced charts? And what would you yeah. recommend? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so for me, I'm a big R user and most, almost all of these charts, um, I think all of them, in fact, in this presentation I made with R, including the animations. So R is nice, it's open source. They have I found a very friendly community for new learners. There's a lot of great resources out there, but uh, you know there are other. You can do a lot of cool animate or vid visualizations in all kinds of software uh, within Excel. Even uh, you can do a lot with it. Um, Python is very popular. People can do uh, almost everything in R the, within that um, uh, with similar sort of level. The one disadvantage of R is that it is a programming-based language. So you do have to write scripts. If you're more familiar, if you're more comfortable with a point and click interface, that, that may be a little bit of a learning curve. And in that case, either Excel or Tableau, for example, can be a, uh, is a tool that's very popular these days. A lot of jobs are using Tableau, uh, which is less, requires less programming. It's a little less flexible, but can do very powerful visualizations as well. Uh, which is related to the next question. If one primarily uses Excel rather than R, uh, do you have any suggestions that are specific to Excel, I guess, best practices that use Excel? Yeah. Well, well, I think a lot of the best practices and guidelines can still be applied to Excel. Now, Excel, I think it's a bad rap in some sense because a lot of people have it and it's their tool. And so it happens to be a lot of, you know, less, uh, less well thought out data visualizations happen to be made in Excel, but it's not an often... Uh, Excel's fault necessarily. So, and, and John Schwabish, and in, in not necessarily in his book, but in some of his other resources, I have a link in the, the Policy Viz, which is his website. He's, he's done some uh, examples where he makes pretty complicated charts in Excel. And there are other people who do that. So there, there are resources out there. I know John in, in particular has some examples of that. And so definitely, if you're using uh, Excel, you can do a lot of creative stuff with it. Uh, can you show a graph, I think which you did, that uses shadowing and when do you think you should use uh, shadows in, in a chart? <laughs> yeah, so this actually came up today. There was a new R package. I was doing some exploration. I talked about the shadow of higher mortgage rates on the market. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, this is a brand new package. I think I just actually made it this morning because uh, it just was out there. I'm not sure. It can be an aesthetic on there. You definitely... Um, I've seen some bad applications of it. I'm still thinking about whether or not, you know, beyond just, you know, the notion of a shadow and play, making a play on that, are there effective reasons for it? I think there are, but I, I have to study it more. I'm just sort of, I'm, a, I, I'm an enthusiastic user. I'll try stuff out, um, but I don't know if I found a great or an ideal use case for it yet, but I'm pretty sure folks will. I noticed that a lot of your charts uh, use color, uh, even, even simple line charts or, or bar charts. So... Do you, do you view that as something that even for simple charts, people should incorporate in their presentations, just the use of, just the use of color to make it, to make it at, at least interesting, if not communicating anything else? Uh, yeah, the, as to one of the guidelines I introduced, you do want to be a little bit deliberate about it. So a useful practice is to start off with it in grayscale um, and then add color. You know, often like, for example, in corporate things, you may have a brand standard. So at Freddie Mac, for example, in some internal reports, you know, we have a corporate color palette. So certain charts have to be blue and then green uh, or orange. 
So different companies may have that, that brand standard, in which case you will apply that color. And so, yeah, I'll often use that. I find that it helps with engagement, but I would, I would recommend that you start uh, with a grayscale chart and then add the color, you know, and not, uh, you know, go all in with a lot of color all at front once. It's easy to go overboard. In some cases, I'm sure I went overboard on some of these. If I were rethinking them, especially some of the more exploratory ones, I might change it up. But, you know, I think it creates some interest. If you're too extreme on the minimalist side, it might get a little, little less interesting for folks. And I have one question too. You, you were talking about text. Uh, I noticed that some of your charts actually have text that kind of either lead to the conclusion, like you're already describing the trend you want people to conclude. And some of your other charts are just, don't seem to make that, 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 you know, that, that available. You're just describing what it is without a conclusion as to what's going on. Um, so when you're presenting before, say, decision makers, uh, how do you make that decision as to your wording? Do you, do you actually want to lead them to your conclusion or how do you, how do you make yeah. that defining line? Yeah, I think you almost always want to take the opportunity to add, a, add some conclusion to help people reinforce what a takeaway might be from that chart. Um, so I, I, and often on some of those charts I've, I've included in the presentation, they're actually part of a, a different presentation where I'll actually use the PowerPoint header to put the more descript, the more active title in there. So often the, 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 the subheader that you see in some of these charts were just examples like this one, for example, mortgage rate trends, right? That's very descriptive, very plain. If I was using this in a presentation, I would probably in the top say something like, you know, low mortgage rates have been helping, you know, drive housing demand or help with affordability or rising rates would, you know, could really challenge the market. Or it depends on what was going on, but I would definitely want to take that opportunity. And I really emphasize that that's a great opportunity for you to communicate more. Um, and just adding that on there, add some extra thought. Um, yeah, you're right. You could steer people a little, but they can look at the data and also come to their own conclusions. But, but at least you take an opportunity to help provide some additional value add. And that's important, especially as a junior analyst starting on things. You know, not I'm not just churning out a chart, but I'm putting some thought into that, and and I'm, uh, right. I'm thoughtful about what's going on. I think that's really important. Uh, do you uh, question from the audience? Do you have any comments on visually visualizing spatial data on GIS systems like ArcGIS, QGIS, and if so, what are what are your favorites or recommended? destinations for data set repositories like population densities, mortgage rates, et cetera? Yeah, um, I haven't done as much with that um, lately. I have uh, some folks on my team who do use the, I think like ArcGIS for some mapping and other things that um, they've looked at, you know, hazard risk in the housing market and done some very interesting analysis. So um, she, she's done some great work on that. I just haven't been as using that kind of mapping stuff as much. When I do, it's often, more general coral plats, you know, general colors, or you know, maybe some dots, um, but at a higher level. But if I did, I think R has some nice packages that can do that. So if I were going to do that, it's probably the way I would go, just because I'm familiar with that tool, not because it's the best. Uh, I'm sure it's it's competitive, but uh, I know that folks that are more in, that are more you know doing a lot of that will use some of those ArcGIS and those things, and um, they can do very very creative stuff with it. Okay. And going back to your comment about using using um, animation sparingly. Can you, expound on, can you expound on that thought? Yeah, I mean, animation is fun. I, lo I love to do it. I love to experiment with it. But I I've often found that when I try to use it in like a business presentation, like uh, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily work as well. Um, it, you know, you have to watch the movie. Uh, it can, it can, but, but uh, you can animate everything. With some of the R package, it's easy to just take a chart and then animate it. Um, and that, that, that can be interesting, but also can be frustrating because you have to sort of watch the things evolve and folks might want to see it and study it a little more. So that's why I would say it's, it's kind of like a showpiece. You might want to create some interest or if you're talking about something dramatic like the jobless claims where it's just shooting way up through the sky and that's the point of that chart is just sort of how the scale just explodes, uh, you can show that. But if you're just showing the evolution of the time series, I mean, I've done those for, before, I have fun with it, but um, I would just say, no want to oh it's easy to overdo it sort of like with powerpoint uh transitions 
you know, you have fun with them, but you don't necessarily want to use them everywhere. Get folks can get annoyed by it. Um, one more question that just came in. Do you, um, any recommendations for preparing or using bubble charts? Yeah, those are there's a couple of different contexts where you might use a bubble chart. So a bubble, I, I presume you mean, you know, the, the charts that you're showing sort of the area of a circle. And you can pack them in, or you can have them placed on a map or in a scatter plot. So I think in, in all, I, all three of those cases, they can be very powerful. So often, for example, if you're showing geo data, like let's say some indicator at a metro level, you could use the size of a bubble to represent the population or housing units or something that, that can be very powerful. Or if you're using a scatter plot and you're looking at the relationship between X and Y for some, uh, some groups, and say you're doing lenders and you want to represent large lenders with bigger bubbles, I think that's, that's very, um, that can be very helpful to help people see where the important points are, particularly if you have an uneven distribution. If you're looking at something where you have a few large entities that, that are very important because they take a lot of the volume, say for lending, for example, uh, then I think that's, a, that's an excellent uh, visualization. But it can be hard for people to tease out those relative areas sometimes. So um, it's something you have to think about, but definitely I, I, I like them. I've done, done, used them a lot and would, would recommend them in the right context, absolutely. Okay. Are there any other uh, questions? Um, so could you un unshare your screen, uh, Ken, and uh, I'll, I'll let Of course. I'll, yeah. I'll, so if there are no questions, um, I'd just like to end with some announcements. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank um, Len Kiefer for joining us tonight and showing us some of his work and some of the um, resources that you guys can tap uh, even after this, this presentation in order to become a better communicators uh, and, and visual presenters uh, at your firms. So just a reminder, this, this uh, video was taped and we will be sending a link to all the uh, registrants so that you could review uh, some of the points that Len made during this presentation. So again, we'd like to thank Len for uh, joining us this evening. Thanks, Len. Yeah, thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Okay. And just as a short announcement, uh, we're accepting applications now for our fall 2021 class for our master's in real estate development. Uh, and also we have an upcoming webinar on March 30 uh, called Where Are We with Blockchain Technology and Real Estate? This is an update of a webinar we did three years ago and kind of revisiting where we are with this uh, sort of exciting technology that's sort of taken over the headlines recently now with, uh, with uh, yeah, cryptocurrency and so forth. So you can register, it's a free seminar at blockchainmason at eventbrite.com. So again, thanks to Len for joining us tonight. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening. And we hope to see you again at a future George Mason University real estate program. Have a good evening. Thank you.